Hi, uh, good evening, or uh, whatever time it is in your part of the world. It's lovely and sunny over here. I'm Ahmed Bargava, I'm a GP, uh, which is a family practitioner in the UK, and I've been uh, since 1991 uh, with a checkered history of doing uh, policy work and uh, developing population health uh, nationally, regionally, and locally and now very involved with wellness and also on a project with uh, the Indian government on behalf of the College of Medicine to bring parts of Indian traditional medicine for its value in wellness to the UK. So welcome and I'm just going to go through a presentation and see if my screen sharing works. It was working a minute back. Right, so um, this is uh, in about half an hour or so, it'll be nine o'clock in India. And they, the Prime Minister's asked 1.3 billion people to light candles for nine minutes uh, together. And the idea is to create collective consciousness to recognize the impact of the coronavirus is having across the world, of course, but also in India, and to create a movement and an understanding uh, how not they couldn't change what the virus does, but what the nation, the communities and individuals can do for themselves and together to beat the impact of this virus. So it's a really important um, moment for India and for us to to understand the value of collective consciousness. Let's see if this moves, yeah. So I think what they're trying to do is uh, to recognize that we can't go back and change the beginning as you can, as we all know, but we are here to change how this ends or we continue to progress with the virus. And and what are you trying to do now and collectively, and that's the reason why we're all talking, is to create a social change so that the movements, the words that suggest vast groups of people walking together, leaving behind one way and traveling towards another. And you and I and, and our communities have noticed that we've learned some things, we have unlearned some things, hopefully forever, and we are changing uh, the communities and who we are uh, in a in a uh, in a progressive way, and we would like to to see if some of the good behaviors that we are learning about us and our communities and working together, we can continue the future. And things that are less important, we unlearn and leave them behind us. So this is an important crossroads for us, and hopefully the the humanity will take this opportunity to change ourselves. So this is, I've got three things to talk about basically, and a number of uh, uh, internet downloads that I'll share with you uh, with Abandon. So this is something from 1632, and uh, it's interesting what people died of. And uh, the biggest death was of course, uh, uh, it's in the middle of your screen on the left-hand side, uh, was to childbirth. And on your right-hand side, uh, Interestingly, people died of lethargy. I think some of us may die of lethargy after this coronavirus is over. And at the bottom, there is people dying suddenly. This is well, how they uh, recorded death. And interestingly, in those in the 1600s, the average lifespan was about 25 years. Most people didn't, 40% didn't ever reach adulthood. And uh, if you got something, you died. So that's something I'm going to talk about. And then behaviors, and I have no idea what, why, why we do this, why when we get depressed, we start eating chocolate. Uh, we'll talk about that. And of course, we will talk about how we focus to do something uh, better in, in the future. So let's just, just move on to the context. So uh, the first context is 
we, what we're trying to do, and the reason we're here is looking at uh, alternative therapies, especially yoga, and that's why Heather is leading on this, and many important speakers like uh, uh, Dean Ornish and Michael Dixon and Ruby Watts and others have talked at length about, uh, about um, the various ways we can keep ourselves well. But the context for us is how do we bring the, the values of the ancient from the millennia and uh, to, to the current? And uh, what, what is it that's important for us to take forward in an evidence-based way so that we understand it in the current context and current language and current culturally sensitive way than what was in the old tradition, especially in the Indian uh, traditional medicine tradition. So this is about, um, the, that's the, the list again, but what it's saying is, if you got something in the context of the old ways before 1900, uh, when you got it, you, you were likely to die from it. It's, and if you look at the list, none of these things, or, or very few of these things in any measurable way uh, the, that uh, we die off now, because modern medicine, as it has evolved, especially since 1900 to 2000, um, it changed many things we do. So uh, just quickly, 1900 to 1950, uh, most of the things that we were trying to get over were related to either industrial problems or due to uh, infections. And with, the, uh, with good industrial um, health and safety issue, uh, uh, methods and with antibiotics we've, and other methods, we have got rid of most of those. Then 15, 1950 to uh, 2000, we were mainly dealing with long-term conditions and singularity, uh, heart disease in its um, uh, heart attacks and uh, strokes and uh, asthma and chronic obstructive diseases in, in singular ways. So we, uh, we were um, looking at single diseases, but from 2000 onwards, uh, the focus has been on long-term conditions. So, so what, uh, why this is important and what uh, uh, Siddhartha Buddha in two, about 2,500 years ago was trying to do was deal with the similar things that human beings are always plagued by. And I won't go through them because we, are not, we don't have that much time. But what he said in the, uh, in the yoga and the Ashtanga, the, the eight limbs, these are really important when you look at them. Nonviolence to ourselves, truthfulness, not stealing. Uh, controlling ourselves and not being too greedy, being clean, being content, being austerity and discipline, self-knowledge, analysis, and surrender divine. So those were eight, uh, these few things on uh, yamas and, and niyamas, which are still useful in our current context. And, but they were created in the context of the, uh, when you had to keep yourselves well, because if you got ill, you died. And also the diet at that time, and if you look at what uh, the Ayurvedic side of diet was on the Satvic, the, uh, the Ratsik and the Thamsik, the diet, the uh, Rats, no, Satvic being the most uh, valued, which was clear and pure, um, uh, was mainly plant-based and uh, had um, created the best thoughts. The Ratsik, of course, was uh, something that created uh, anxiety, uh, um, uh, stimulated you and tamsic, which made you, uh, made you, uh, made us all um, uh, lethargic. So, but the diet was not only food uh, because we had to have good diet. It was also what we ate, we listened to, we read and the people we stayed with. And so the idea was not only to feed our bodies but also to feed our souls. And this is quite important in the old context because this is how we were reducing stress and we will talk about the impact of stress in a moment, but it's important to relate to our ancestors to say they had some good thinking based on experience and over the millennia, they refined it and something we, we should take value from. They also felt the value of the, the garden and we know now the evidence is if you spend 20 minutes in nature, uh, once a day it reduces the stress. So they were well ahead of us to, uh, to see the value of nature and exercise in, in nature. They also felt that, and this is an interesting one that uh, we do, I do this a lot, do, buy stuff that I'm never gonna use. Um, 
uh, that to to declutter ourselves and there's an interesting book called Stuffocation, which talks about the value of having less. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So uh, that is a past. And so, and we know for us that health does not always come from medicine. We know that because uh, we're all here wanting to do something different, which is non-biomedical. And most of the times comes from peace of mind, peace in the heart, peace in the soul. And it comes from laughter and love. And in this time of the coronavirus, we're having to test all these things and sometimes having more of them and sometimes less, but it is giving us time to reset ourselves. So let me just get a drink. So where does health come from? And the arrogance of uh, medicine sometimes is that we think as medical practitioners and medical organizations that we're actually creating health, but we know at the best of times, we create only 15 to 20% of health. The rest uh, comes from um, other indicators like social socioeconomic impacts, lifestyles, environment, and uh, our, uh, uh, who, who we are and our genetics possibly. So let's see where we can move from pathogenesis to salutogenesis. What pathogenesis is, what I was trained to do was to look at the causes of diseases and how to stop them and to reduce the impact on us. The salutogenesis, uh, a newish concept started by Anton Antonovsky, is looking at the causes of wellness. And this is where it's really important for us to focus away from pathogenesis because we know that only creates, and, and the whole industry behind pathogenesis only creates 15 to 20% health. So salutogenesis becomes an important part for us for the future, um, especially when we have diseases which are uh, uh, communicable diseases with which, for which we have no cure. And um, SAR, uh, uh, COVID-19 is one of them before we had SARS and the swine flu and the rest of them where we all Ebola, we all panicked because once it got into us, we had nothing to save ourselves with other than, other than our, uh, our resilience, communities and our strong bodies. So the medicine is changing and it started differently. It started, it had a different need in the last century and now in this century it has a different need and we're changing a little bit slowly, but we are changing and recognizing that we have limitations, but also a contribution. So what, just to say, as a clinician, my job, job is to diagnose and try and fix uh, what I can diagnose with the, the tools that I have, and they are limited in, in quantity and what they do. My therapy colleagues will help with recovery in the rehabilitation after illness, and my scientists, scientist colleagues were looking for breakthroughs, whether it's genomics or uh, bio, uh, uh, all the, the biologics we are trying to do with. So there are uh, people working on looking at new diseases and new fixes. But currently, as uh, uh, Wayne Jonas has put in, is it, we are very good with the small in particular. So if you have a chest infection, a heart attack, a stroke, uh, we can do good things with them because we know exactly what to do, a heart failure. But if you have something which is a person with many diseases, with comorbidities and uh, complexity and lifestyle issues, things that affect them from work, from where they live, what their domestic arrangements are, their relationships are, their community contacts are. We as clinicians have very little impact on them, but that might be the major cause of their problem and we can't fix it. We have to realize that. So we have to go outside of our, um, uh, our comfort zone to work with others. And that's what we are learning. So we're learning that what I see as a clinician is 80% of my diseases are lifestyle related uh, and they are new. Who knew about type two diabetes and Alzheimer's and so many cancers uh, in, in the past because one, we didn't live long enough, but also some of these things are related to uh, our lifestyle. And the biggest cause of the disease as we, we know is the chronic inflammation, which causes not only diabetes, heart disease, arthritis, but all kinds of things. And the contribution from is not just a lifestyle of eating too much or being depressed or anxious and uh, chronic anxiety. 
or not doing enough um, exercise, um, it, it, it has all those together reduce our immunity to fight diseases and those diseases, the body as a very complex and intricate self-regulatory system breaks down and the, uh, so we get dis-ease within our bodies and the diseases are with it, of course. So what is the current medicine doing to help is moving to empowering patient, enabling the physician to have different languages to enhance wellness and curing the well before they get sick. So we are on that, but on that trajectory using predictive, preventive, personalized and participatory medicine. So these are changes that we're doing, but we are limited by the things that get in the way. So uh, the drug industry, the pharma, uh, for all the good that it has done, but it also has a major impact on what we do. So evidence-based medicines, RCTs, came in the 1950s. 50s, basically to look at our chemicals that we use. Evidence-based medicine may be saying that medicine is what it's about. But what we are looking at in wellness is experiential work that happened over millennia to see what works with us. So the clinician's beliefs on RCTs uh, is quite, uh, can be, uh, take us backwards. The payment structures where we're not paid to keep people well, or we're paid to when they get sick. And defensive practices, apart from doing lots of tests. And sometimes you find in our tests things that would, would don't, don't kill, but we, we start treating things that are, are not a problem. So, but also the patient's beliefs and behaviors where uh, patients believe that there is a fix for every ill that they have. And then we can, as, as clinicians, we fix it and forget it. And people uh, get the false belief that we are fixing them. So that's, here we come to the more interesting part of the conversation is on the different type of healthcare. This is from Wayne Jonas's uh, work uh, slides. So uh, as I'm part of, uh, on the College of Medicine as well on the council, and we are very involved with integrative care where we take the value of conventional medicine uh, because none of us would like to go to an alternative complementary therapist if you have a heart attack or a stroke, but we, uh, uh, we would like to use conventional medicine and the complementary and alternative medicine, uh, like yoga, all the therapies we have, the acupuncture, etc., who complement what conventional medicine can do and sometimes better. And of course, supported self-care where the patient uh, takes uh, with informed uh, uh, care, looks after themselves in the conditions there are with the idea that they're able to maintain a good lifestyle, but a healthy lifestyle. So. Uh, but the science behind that is, and I just like to concentrate on the top, uh, just under the green, where if you do population health, it has a better return on investment than if you do the traditional way of medicine we do. And that's where my interest started was in population health and now into wellness, because population health is not about more pathogenic medicine. This is the, the, the framework. This is the evidence behind wellness. And this is from what works in well-being, uh, where they took 26 areas that create wellness and broke them down to seven um, uh, key areas for personal well, uh, including personal well-being. And this is the science behind wellness. So we have to look not just on the traditional methods of Ayurveda or yoga or Tai Chi or others, but also look at the no, um, the, the modern methods of creating us remaining well. And and they. So early childhood we know is key to whatever happens and how little we spend money and time on it. Uh, of course, having education, the conditions of work, because good work, it's not meaningful work that is really important. Bad work can be really bad for us. How do we age gracefully? Because we know uh, in, aging in, in our aging communities, uh, especially in the poor uh, people, they have a greater disability uh, disabilities at the end of life than people who are rich and educated, about 12 years as compared to seven. And the resilience of our communities, can we create a self-healing communities where, and we have this opportunity with Corona now, where people are looking inside them, the communities for the wellness, rather than looking at medicine and statutory bodies because those are fully stretched. So this is a moment for creating resilience communities where we are self-healing. And of course, fairness, how, how, 
angry we feel when we are treated unfairly, either by the system, by individuals, or by organizations. We have to, and these matter because these, all these together with others, create wellness within us. And if you read Yuval Harai's book on sapiens, he says, what is happiness? Happiness, which is transitory, is the general feeling of well-being. If we can create a general feeling of well-being, we're likely to create happiness, which is more sustainable, which reduces our stresses, reduces, improves our immunity, and makes us more resilient to, uh, to infections. So these are other slides which give us ideas of what is work that is meaningful to us. Having hope, such an important thing for us because that creates optimism and that reduces stress. Warm and positive relationships, of course we want them and those are really important. The, the dynamic model for individual well-being, these are the evidences that we can look at and uh, we don't have time today, but these are important for us to be looking at. So the SOAP is what we do. It is a subjective, objective assessment and planning type of, uh, if you go to see a doctor, you would get a SOAP type of consultation. Now we are trying to move to hope where it's about healing, uh, oriented practice and environments. We look at what is important to the patient, what matters to the patient, and what mode of healing they would like to use. So it's a much more adult conversation. It's about healing using the patient's own assets and uh, uh, history to make them better rather than subjecting them to something which has gone through an RCT but worked somewhere for somebody else in a certain circumstance. So personalized medicine is becoming more important to the healing and our resilience. Okay, I'll take a breather here. It is interesting, isn't it, that um, uh, we have to talk about breath and and hydration at this time. And this has been something for 2,500 years. Uh, if you look at Ayurveda, uh, has been talking about incessantly about the value of drinking water and enough of it and warm water, which that's what I was drinking now. And yoga, and the Ashtanga yoga, the eight limbs is all encompassing and uh, it is the center of uh, the Indian tradition for wellness because it is, it is uniting and it brings all aspects of healing together in one place. But we have, of course, in the, in the West, looked at it uh, from the Hatha Yoga side, the, the, only the, the asanas, but we have to start with, we are talked about the yamas and niyamas before. Um, and, but uh, the slight uh, levity is around, we have to create the balance and we have to look at the old practices in the context of the new where we would like to have of course sattvic and pure and clear food and thinking but sometimes we want to be excited and sometimes we just want to be lazy and we get to have the balance and sometimes we want to drink wine and and sometimes we just want to be lazy so we have to take it in context and be make it accessible to normal human beings who are not driven as some people are to maintain wellness. Prehabilitation, because Heather said I should be talking about this on, YouTube, on uh, Facebook this morning. This is really quite important, actually. It, the, the, the important thing is because this is, can give us a short-term fix. Uh, so if we do muscle conditioning and breathing and strengthening and doing, getting, stopping smoking and doing all the things that cause us harm, and we know them, we're intelligent human beings, we know the stuff that we do, we shouldn't be doing like going back past a packet of biscuits and not stopping ourselves. So all those bits over this period of time where we are highly, uh, uh, we are highly likely to get the coronavirus, uh, if you go out and do the wrong things, is how do we make ourselves strong? So muscle strengthening and uh, breathing, etc., will help us even in the short term. So prehabilitation, getting us ready, just in case we get the coronavirus, may help us even now. So that's quite an important uh, message takeaway. It's never too late. So we also know, and I, and I think uh, most of the other big speakers have talked about this, the exercise, reducing bad stress and creative thoughts and activity are really key. And this is the work that was done by Elizabeth Blackman around on telomeres and telomerase, uh, that the telomeres, uh, uh, the tail halves with every 
um, uh, every time the cell uh, replicates and and once the telomere disappears the cell dies and what she found was you could lengthen the telomerase in very uh, it's, it's a very uh, basic way of saying if you if you do exercise reduce your stress your bad stress especially and have creative thoughts and activity being optimist having a good diet and of course good sleep is our key to our wellness and our resilience and reducing our uh, uh, infective uh, uh, that sort of big, don't get infected easily. But what's, uh, what is also highly contagious as a corona is kindness, patience, love, enthusiasm, and positive attitude. These are, are really key because when we are kind to people and we give and we find the evidence is the people who volunteer, the receiver uh, gives, gets something, but the giver gets even more. So those uh, kindness and love and enthusiasm for our communities and patients with our loved ones at home when we are self-isolating with them uh, are key and to, of course, to maintain a positive attitude because this will pass. Of course, and, and now that we are in this state of self-isolation, I think we are always started thinking about all the things we have to be grateful for, our good health, of course, if we are healthy, uh, the good families, a roof over our head, ability to eat, and not everybody who is self-isolating is uh, is having this positive uh, uh, positive experience. Other people are bad, so badly in, in, uh, affected. And so I think we have to be kind and generous to them, but also be grateful for what we have. And we've suddenly discovered communities because we know our statutory, group, uh, statutory organizations haven't got the capacity to help us. So we are finding community strength. Yesterday, in a very safe way, we, in our own houses, um, we had a sing along outside. In, in outside, and that people haven't seen for a long time came, uh, uh, were out there joining in the singing without infecting each other. We were very, very safe. This is an interesting one. We're finding in the UK, sorry, um, that the the recycling bins are full of clothes and things people don't want because people are decluttering. But I hope we will then move to minimalism where we start discovering how little we actually need. Uh, and I mentioned the book on suffocation, but we know the science that the less we have, the happier we are and the more generous we are when oh, our needs are less. But also at this time, uh, we are the end of life de deserves as much beauty and care and respect as the beginning because some of my patients are are going to pass away uh, before the time because of Corona. And what do we do as communities to make ourselves more resilient to be able to give um, uh, in a way that is makes people's end of life good? But. Um, so the bottom it says values multiplied by behavior equals, equals culture. And I think we are discovering our values and we are changing our behaviors and hopefully our culture. But it is going to be a difficult one because the ending and losing is difficult. And then we hope to go into a neutral zone where, where we adjust the new reality. And I'm hoping against all hope and but being optimist that we will create a new beginning which is different and better than the past we had. Everything in your life is a reflection, a choice of what you have made. If you want a different result, make a different choice. And I think, I'm hoping we will all make a different choice. Thank you. Right. What happens now? I'm in Heather's hands. I think our questions will come up if there are any questions. There are two. From Matthew, thank you. Mention equality. Uh, Matthew says uh, uh, we share a, a very weird sense of humor. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Dr. Bargava, for your excellent presentation. Thank you for that. Uh, you mentioned equality in several contexts as well as fairness as a social health determinant. Can you see possibilities of how the crisis might address these issues despite repression by the power of stakeholders? Any suggestions locally for listeners? 
I think equality is, is a difficult one. How, where do you see yourselves as equal? And um, we addressed equality for the vulnerable people and the people in, this, in our community because people we used to call them people who were not who were not seen they were not seen because we had gone to find them and now uh, with the coronavirus what we're finding is there is an national i suspect an international effort uh, using data and local knowledge and communities to find people who are most vulnerable who have unequal access to to whatever it is and the human spirit now what i'm finding is uh, that is is very generous and is finding people and addressing inequalities what i'm hoping is that now that we found people who are vulnerable and have uh, have unequal access to health wealth or wellness that we will remember this and and create local action that will affect them and it has to be local because nationally uh, or internationally it can't be done but it is creating a, notion, a national or a collective consciousness around vulnerability and health inequalities, and I hope you'll address that. So the question from Karen is, what are the different types of yoga or different aspects of yoga we do in the West that we could learn from the East? To tell you the truth, when I was in India and, and growing up, we did very little yoga as we as we see it in the West, which is mainly Hatha yoga and all the various types of Hatha yoga. Um, what what we were very influenced by was those yamas and niyamas and the aspects behind that because that was part of our culture and uh, meditation and and prayer and chanting was part of the culture. So we actually didn't know we were doing yoga, but we were doing it yoga. So for us in the West now living here, uh, it has to be, it's the way of life and not just the yoga asanas and postures and a way of stretching that we do. And we need to look at the, all the eight limbs and go through them uh, and try to be, to get to the place where we get samadhi and, and uh, hard as it is, but we need to do that more. How to practically, do, how to practically do we keep hope alive while in these difficult times? As I say in, in my clinical circles that a kidney stone, uh, for a kidney stone, this too will pass and so will the coronavirus. And that creates hope because it is time limited. We don't know how much and how it changes us to keep ourselves well and alive, but it will pass. And our opportunities now are whatever our circumstances are, and there are many different good and difficult, that we find a way of finding what is good and focusing on the optimistic the, the 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 constructive and optimistic and build on that and find people and create communities as we can digitally as we are today talking that we uh, are able to then continue those communities which are self-healing and contributory to our local uh, populations and also to us uh, who have uh, who want to think together and differently I'm, yeah, that's the, all the wisdom I have, actually. Anything else? I can see no more questions. Amit? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Can you turn your video back on? <laughs> oh, I'm off the video. Sorry, how did I do that? And there is another question on the chat in chat let me look at chat as do you have suggestions for connecting in the community during lockdown a great presentation oh that's oh that's the first one from my good friend subrata bhattacharya in boston 
at least is not making fun of me. Great presentation, thanks, but uh, oh, what are your thoughts on individualized care that you talk of as medicine moves towards artificial intelligence and less human contact? Yes, artificial intelligence and, and natural stupidity. I think we, uh, the problem is the artificial intelligence is be very useful for certain things. And uh, there's a joke around uh, what is the bigger threat, artificial intelligence or, or natural stupidity uh, of human beings. And I think if we are wise, the human beings will we use artificial intelligence to do the things that are repetitive and uh, we gives us better data to use our knowledge and then use our intelligence to create a change. And that has to be at an individual level because we can't, uh, unless the individual changes, uh, we feel the change within us, only, then only we can change outside. But the collective is around um, uh, the, the social movement that we're trying to create is to get people who are like thinkers and create enough people who think alike to create a unchangeable movement so that we don't go back to the bad ways of high consumption, uh, high uh, dependence on, uh, on health structures and low, depend and low input from ourselves to keep, keep ourselves well. Uh, thanks, Joe. Um, here we are from Karen Bell. Thank you for the answer. The whole present. I hope you can connect with our spiritual side more than the West and learn from this. Absolutely. I think the spirit is the key in this and the spirituality of whatever kind we do is, is important, but we need to find the right spirituality, which is inclusive. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, thank you, Karen. And thank you, Jean. I have, there's nothing else for, for me. Uh, there and thanks, Butter again. Glorious silence. I think we're all meditating. Bye and thank you very much. I shall go and enjoy the sunshine and do some gardening. And I hope you all have a wonderful, healthy, safe uh, transition through this period. Talk to you soon. Bye.